So welcome to Tea, the first Wicked Weed presented by Dory Codington with Stores Library. My name is Heather and I'm the Adult Services Director here at Stores. In December of 1767, the town meeting of Harvard, Massachusetts voted to discourage the sale and purchase of items as varied as tea, carriages, and ready-made clothing. Material culture had increasingly made women's lives easier and so the rejection of it shows us that consumers are willing to separate themselves from Britain. Much of the rhetoric at the beginning of this path toward the revolution centered on tea, that wicked weed. Dory Codington is a local historian and novelist. As a Freedom Trail and Faneuil Hall guide for the National Park Service, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Good she enough. Began to <laughs> She began to investigate the social changes that were necessary to embrace the higher notion of independence and America's break from Great Britain. She has three novels set during this period, Cardinal Points, The Side Turning Water, and Fate and Fair Winds. So welcome, Dory, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. So the first thing we have to talk about is consumer culture. And I think we all know about what consumer culture is. Um, we're deep in the middle of it now, but it isn't new to any of us. Um, it was, in fact, a huge part of America in the 18th century. Not so much in the 17th when people were doing subsistence farming and eking out a living. But by the 18th century, in the 1700s, um, the Industrial Revolution had happened in England and there was a lot of what we would call stuff coming to America and America was buying it. So we know Boston. And if you Google Boston, one of the very first things that comes up is Tea Party. Um, Maybe a little less so now as we've moved away from the bicentennial, but certainly in the 1970s, this was the case. So much so that the vodka company, Absolute, which is definitely not an American company, but a Swedish one, used tea crates floating in the harbor as their image of what is Boston. This was the stamp at the bicentennial of the Tea Party in 1973, because the Tea Party was 1773. Of course, it was not called that then. This was a rock and roll venue that was at Fort Point, not far from where the Tea Party Shipping Museum is now, actually. And this is the Tea Party. This is an ad for the Tea Party ship party like it's 1773, a very modern line. The ship actually existed in Fort Point for quite a while until it was struck by lightning and burned. They rebuilt it and it again, a workman's torch set it on fire and it burned. Then they carted the relic of it up to the North Shore, rebuilt it and then brought it back down to Boston and it is now the Ship and Museum. And here it is. It's very cute. It looks like the beaver, which was one of the ships. No story about tea or about the American Revolution can be told without mentioning where it was grown. And here is tea growing on a hill in northern China. Tea was picked and brought down by river to the tea sorting, I don't know, manufacturers, if you will, um, and where they worked on it for European tastes. Europeans actually liked a heartier blend of tea. If you've drunk green tea, it's not at all like black tea. And the English and the Americans preferred the, the sharper flavored black tea. Surrounding tea in Europe were a whole bunch of consumer items. Um, required hot water, the teapot in which the tea was brewed, the cream and the sugar, and often a slop bucket to put the used leaves into the, the bucket. 
This is tea. It is, um, was pressed into usually a beautiful brick and then your maid or your mom would chip off a piece of it and put it in the pot for brewing. That's the other side of it. And here is just what it looks like when you get to, to chip it off. This is a tea crate that looks very much like the ones that were um, put in the harbor. There are two that are known from that night. One is on loan from the DAR uh, to the Massachusetts Historical Society, and one is at the DAR headquarters in Washington, D.C., in the Massachusetts room. This is tea that is going to be shipped to America, not from China, but from Portsmouth, England, because Parliament passed a law that all goods that were to be shipped to America had to go to England first, and that included tea, even if it was a shorter distance from China to Boston. This is a family um, I actually have the name of the artist. Well, we won't worry about it. It is an English family in the 1720s drinking tea. And you can see all those accoutrements um, on the table and how carefully they're dressed and how elegant it is to drink tea with their spaniel waiting for his dish, I guess. This is a Dutch family drinking tea. The maid obviously is not going to join them, but she looks more than bored. Tea was so valuable in the first half of the 18th century that the key was kept on a chain around the homeowner's neck or waist and the tea was locked up in the caddy. In fact, I think there's an episode of one of those British early uh, historical things where the tea has been stolen, and I think that's Victorian. So that went on quite a while where they were worried about who stole the tea and who had the key. This was a Chinese made tea caddy. Um, made in China for America or England, not for use in China. This is part of the China trade. This is a silver tea set. <clears throat> they get fancier and fancier as you head into the 18th century, and these are all 18th century uh, gugas. This one was made probably for Needham, Massachusetts. I am told that the pansy is the symbol of Needham because it was bred there, so. This is again an 18th century tea set. These are sugar tongs for putting your sugar in the tea. A jelly mold, sugar was formed in the same way it came almost in liquid form and then hardened in the sugar mold. The most important Bostonian associated with the revolution, Paul Revere, painted by John Singleton Copley. Of all things, he is holding a teapot that he made. And these are Paul Revere tea things. Okay, the, back to Boston at the time of the tea party. This is how small Boston is. And you can see um, that tiny little point down at the bottom was the only way in or out by land. Everything else was water. It was one of the smallest peninsulas in the world and one of the busiest ports west of Wales. It had a deep harbor, was considered deep at the time. 
And New York, because it had been under Dutch rule for so long, had never become a, a very busy English port. That would happen later. So this is Boston at the time of 1773, though the map is two years later. This is the symbol of the um, East India Company, four continents and parliament. That's its. Okay, this is just a bill of sale for a Boston household, August 1766, to give you some idea of what it is that people can buy, what they are exposed to on a this is just a daily delivery that I found at the Boston Public Library. And it includes lemons, limes, bread, beef, cow parts, a leg of lamb, cucumbers, cider, spirits, wine, claret, and sugar. And that's just a weekly delivery. So they were not living off the land in any uh, poor way. Okay, so we are now getting to the point where the town of Boston is deciding that they are becoming too English. And there is no point, no point in the 18th century where America, the American colonies, were more English than just before the American Revolution. And that is one of the more interesting uh, points about the American Revolution. They weren't separating from England because they didn't like it. They were separating from England because they were so like England, they wanted to be considered English citizens. And that is where the division came. So the town took into consideration the petition of a number of inhabitants that some effectual measures might be agreed upon to promote industry in the town to separate themselves from England, that stuff could be made in America instead of everything being imported. <clears throat> so they had a very large and full meeting. The following votes and resolutions were passed. The excessive use of foreign superflu superfluities is the chief cause of the present distressed state of the town. They were having a depression, as is hereby drained its money, which misfortune is likely to be increased by the means of the late additional burdens and impositions on trade of the province, meaning the taxes have gone up, which threaten the country with poverty and ruin. So the town meeting voted that this town will take all prudent and legal measures to encourage the produce and manufacture of things in the province and to lessen the use of the superfluities and particularly the following enumerated articles imported from abroad. And the list is very long, but I'll read a few of them. Loaf sugar, cordage, anchors, coaches, women's hats, men's and women's apparel ready-made, household furniture, gloves, men's and women's shoes, children's stays, fire engines, chinaware, silk and cotton velvets, gauze, pewters, hollowware, linseed oil, and it goes on. So the idea was to stop importing this long list of things and begin producing more things themselves. And this is what the published um, thing from that town meeting looks like, October 28th, 1767. The meetings always began in Faneuil Hall. And this is the picture of that hall before Quincy, well before Quincy Market was built and before the hall was enlarged by Bullfinch in the early 1800s. The meetings would get so big and so raucous that they had to leave the town-owned hall. And when that happened, they would inevitably go to the Old South Meeting House. This is what it looks like today, very early in the morning when there's no traffic. This is Washington Street 
in Boston, and that's Old South. They would then walk from Faneuil Hall, usually through what we call the old state house now, banging on the doors to tell the governor that he was in trouble, and then walk down Washington Street to the um, meeting house, which was not a publicly owned building, but rather owned by its congregation. And then the town couldn't stop anyone from saying anything they wanted there. So they would then go to the biggest building in town, which happened to be Old South, where the meetings would continue. And so the town, this is another um, town meeting record of the town of Boston in October 67, voted the town to take all prudent and legal measure, measures to encourage the produce and manufacture. And this is a similar, but not did not get beautifully printed like Boston's did, but this is the same list of things put out at the Harvard town meeting and after Harvard in every town in the colony. And it wasn't just in Boston that they decided to increase local production. This is the women in North Carolina sign signing an agreement not to buy certain British made goods. And it of course is a caricature, but there you can see them all signing the contract. Uh, here are a few of the ready-made items that I uh, threw into the PowerPoint for fun. <clears throat> so those are the pretty stockings that you can buy so you don't have to knit them yourself. Shifts, stays, hats, beautiful slippers. Remember, Cinderella. Beautiful gloves. They're very hard to make yourself, so you're going to have to do without now after you've signed that contract. You're certainly not going to get those. And this is what you are going to make yourself. You're going to go to simple linen and wool clothing, which maybe you'll be able to weave yourself or your neighbor will. And you're going to give up your elegant cape, muff, and gown. And that one if you even owned it, which you probably didn't. This is called the robe a la Française, and it was, it individually, it used between, between 10 and 12 yards of fabric. This was very popular, um, probably in Virginia and in England, not so much in New England. And they have agreed to cease purchasing and using all of these brocades, silks, and lawns that are manufactured in England. So regular colonists, women especially, are then as now the main domestic purchasers for their homes. Uh, men don't go out and shop but women do. They go to the stores, and when they do go to the store, they decide what a family will buy and what it will not buy. So what will encourage women who are not members of town meeting yet, what will encourage them to make this sacrifice and stop using British-made things? They did not have time to read Thomas Paine or go to Boston and hear Samuel Adams. But something else was happening in the beginning of the 18th century, the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening spoke to New Englanders in a way that it probably didn't speak to anybody else quite as easily. John Wesley was an Anglican minister and founder of Methodism. He called for a close relationship between the worshiper and God. The Great Awakening swept Protestant Europe and British America in the 1730s and 40s, just about the same or just before the generation of these people giving up British made goods. So it was getting deep into their nomenclature into their minds. It was an evangelical and revitalization movement. Powerful preachers gave listeners a sense of deep 
personal revelation of their need for salvation by Jesus Christ. The Great Awakening pulled worshipers away from ritual, away from the even further away from the incense and ceremony that the Anglicans had saved from the Catholic, they away from sacramentalism and hierarchy, even away from congregationalism and the idea that the congregation alone could hire the minister. This was a personal and an intensely personal fostering a deep sense of spiritual conviction and redemption, encouraging introspection and commitment to a new standard of personal morality that the individual had a relationship with the divine, that you and God were judged. Well, God was not judged, but that you individually were judged by God by your life on earth. George Whitfield came to America from England and worked all on the East Coast, settling in Savannah, Georgia. He traveled through the 13 colonies preaching. And according to Benjamin Franklin, who calculated how far his voice would travel and how many people would fit in a field, he was <clears throat> claimed that he could preach to 30,000 people at one gathering. Must have been quite a voice. This happens to be um, the Whitfield Elm, the symbol of Wilmington, Mass, where George Whitfield preached in 1754 or 55. And then we get to our most local minister. Jonathan Edwards was from Northampton, Massachusetts. He used imagery that made sense to New England Puritans and the descendants of Puritans. He preached his most famous and published piece, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It is still in print. I even have it on my Kindle, which is pretty amusing. And he preached it 1741, July 8th, Enfield, Connecticut in which he said that God will judge your actions on earth. This personal responsibility between you and God dictated the decisions you made and there was no intermediary between you and God, which became no intermediary between you and the king. And about the same time, the prayers in church instead of blessing the king at every at every um sunday was suddenly left out of the catechism you're no longer saying and god bless the king amen it got left out and anyway jonathan edwards got himself a stone in edfield connecticut at the spot where he preached it in july 8 1741 God judges directly, not through any person, king, or government. So that when women were called to make these changes to their consumerism, people who had already learned that they had a personal responsibility to their families, a personal responsibility to their communities, personal responsibility to God, that they had the ability to affect that change and they did so. So here we are in November of 1773. And England has passed a law saying that they will take the tax off of all goods being shipped into Boston. They're very, very hungry for America's money. And people are not buying what they expected them to buy. And so in reaction, they took away the tax. But it had to be British made tea or shipped tea. It couldn't be French or Dutch or German. It had to come from England. So three ships arrived in November of 1773. And the governor had to decide within 30 days 
whether they would unload that British tea and therefore put most merchants in the town of Boston out of business because they already had tea, but it was Dutch and it was French and they would not be allowed to sell it. Hutchinson had decided that only his friends and his family could sell the tea that was sitting out there in the harbor. So they had a meeting to decide what they should tell the governor. He had 30 days to either unload the tea or send those ships back to England. So were they going to unload the detestable tea or were they going to um, send the ships back? Because the detestable tea sent out by the East India Company, part of which has just arrived in this harbor. So they're at Faneuil Hall at nine o'clock in the morning. And here's the hall today. It's a lot bigger. And here's Old South Meeting House today, done in artist's rendering. So here's the East India Company, and we're waiting for Thomas Hutchinson, one of the most, yeah, we have never had good relations with our governors. This has been a Massachusetts tradition, and we had one that snuck out in the middle of the night disguised as a woman, and then Hutchinson, just a few years later, is now the most detested man in the colony of Massachusetts. Here he is. He was the 17th and 19th governor appointed by the King of England, George III, and he served in 1760 and in 1769 to 1774. And it is Thomas Hutchinson who is going to decide what to do with the tea that is in that harbor. And on the night of the 16th of December, so it's been there almost a full month, he now has to make this decision on whether or not that tea is going to be unloaded or if it is going to be sent back to England. He decides it will be unloaded because he is that lovable. So in the middle of the night, longshoremen and sailors, shipbuilders and ship sail makers and caucuses, the caucus meaning the men who put the tar between the boards of a ship, from the north end, from the south end, Sons of Liberty from the area near the common where they met in a distillery, go down to the harbor after Samuel Adams in the Old South Meeting House gives a high sign in which he says, there is nothing further this meeting can do for our country. It's a very strange thing to say because it's about tea sitting in the harbor, but it was the sign that all the men would walk out of that meeting. They would go to the taverns and pubs in the immediate area where they would put face paint and on their cheeks and feathers in their hair where they channeled the most fierce warriors they knew, the Mohawk Indians, and they ran down to the harbor and working in total silence, dumped 92,000 pounds of tea into Boston Harbor, the value of which I looked up today because it does change, about $1 million worth of tea in today's money what happened in response to that. So here's artists rendering of what went on. You notice there are people cheering them on. It happened in total darkness and in total silence. Nobody was there cheering on treason. If any of those people had been caught, they would have been hanged. In fact, Samuel Adams and John Hancock left that meeting where they sat in John Hancock's front window 
drinking wine so that anybody who walked by could see them and say, oh, they're not at the harbor, they're at home. This is a courier in Ives done about a hundred years later. So there is the Minuteman. So what did the British government do in response to the tea being dumped in the harbor? They passed an act in which they said that no ships will go into Boston and no ships will go out of Boston. They closed the harbor until the merchants of Boston were willing to pay for the tea. There were some that wanted to, but most did not. And so that didn't happen. And the reason there's a Minuteman there is a year and a half later, Paul Revere will um, rally the countryside. And in fact, the first shots in response to the British closing the port, um, the shots are fired. As the British worry about the armaments that are in the countryside and that they need to collect them because they have so angered Boston. And by angering Boston, angered the rest of the province or colony. So tea drinking, although it isn't really about tea, it is really about the superfluid teas and the, um, and the domestic choices made by New Englanders has a lot to do with beginning the revolution. So, but back to tea, everybody answer this question. How many people had a cup of coffee this morning and how many people had a strong bracing cup of English breakfast tea? I would bet that most people had coffee and coffee drinking is one of the greatest reactions to this destruction of the tea. Most people in America did not drink tea again until the 20th century. They drank chocolate, they drank coffee, but they did not drink tea really until Russian and German immigrants brought tea with them as a um, commodity that they enjoyed drinking from the old country. So we can now open this to anyone who is curious about anything I may have left out. So if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to go ahead and unmute and ask. Or if you'd like to ask via chat, I will monitor the chat um, function as well. So I thought it was very interesting um, how much the tea was actually worth in today's uh, dollars. Oh yeah, it was a very <laughs> important commodity. Took a lot of work to get there. And you notice that England, um, because of various wars with China, which has to do more with English history than American, switched tea growing to India. And all those beautiful tea plantations in India are because of England's growing them there. So that was the so East India Tea Company. We have a question from Debbie. Did people of all ages drink tea during this time? Yes, it was sort of what you did mid-morning or mid-afternoon. Um, it was a luxury item that was not all that expensive per cup. And you could certainly stop your work and have a, have a small cup of it. I don't know if people gave it to their kids. They may have. I know that um, as part of a 20th century thing, my mother did give us tea when we were little. So that may have been, um, they may have done that also. It was a delightful luxury, which is why the ministers called it a wicked weed because it let women sit down for a minute 
and oh, horrors a minute out of your busy day. Get back to work, right? <laughs> right. Does anybody else have any questions? Hi. Uh, it's Richard. I was wondering, um, did, were the, the people who threw the tea into the harbor, were they afraid that the British tea would sort of be bought by a lot of the local Boston people and sort of ruin their boycott? Like, didn't, how many people agreed with that versus didn't? Ah, interesting question. The town meeting agreed that they were not going to let the governor unload the lower priced tea. The British had voted to take the tax off the tea and they kept lowering the price of the tea. But mostly they were angry because Hutchinson's friends were going to be the only ones allowed to sell that tea. And so it was very much a crony problem. And he was not a loved governor by any stretch of the imagination. He was born in Boston and wrote the most amazing history of the town of Boston, but he um, was really not liked. They did burn his house a couple times. Ooh, the Boston geez. mob was not nice. Uh, so we have like another. The I'm worst sorry, Richard. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, that was like the worst choice he could have done. Then. <laughs> like, yes, it was. He and he knew better. He did know better because he knew. He knew Boston. He was born in this town. He grew up in the town. His grandmother was Anne Hutchinson, who was expelled from Massachusetts. He got it, but he was also an appointed crony of the king, and he was doing what the king wanted him to do. So he was between a rock and a hard place. I'll give him that. Thank you. Sure. We have another question in the chat. Could you show us the slide of the tea set again and take us back through the name and purpose of each item in the set? Sure. Let's find a nice juicy one. Doo, doo, doo. And there's another question from Debbie. What beverages other than tea were popular during this time? Chocolate and then Chocolate. later coffee. But definitely chocolate, Baker's Chocolate in Boston. You can still see the building on the Milton Roxbury line. It's a beautiful building. Um, was very hot chocolate, which was not sweetened. It was not Dutch chocolate. So it wasn't um, alkalized yet, but it was, um, so it was a bitter drink, but very mm. yummy. It's like if you took unsweetened chocolate, added a little bit of sugar and put it in hot water. Mm. All right, tea sets, here we go. Okay, so teapot, no, that's not the most complicated one. Let's, okay, so you have the teapot. I don't know if my pointer works for you guys, probably not. Can, can you see the pointer? Nah. No. Okay, so you have the teapot and the hot water. Those are the two most important things. And you pour the concentrated tea, which is made in the kitchen ahead of time, and you boil water and that goes into the hot pot. And then the concentrated tea and the hot water are poured together into your cup. And then there is a bowl for the leftover tea leaves after they're strained. And then of course there is sugar and there is cream. So the, the pot on the upper right, would that be the teapot or the hot water pot? I think that's the water because it's the bigger one. And then the upper left would be the teapot? Yes. And then and there's cream and sugar. And I don't mm -hmm. know exactly, they may have had, this may be two types of tea because I, I don't see the slot bowl here. Maybe that was never pretty. Mm. You can find another one. The tea oh. boxes are beautiful. Aren't they amazing? They're so yeah. beautifully done. Um, so let's see, teapot, 
hot water. Uh, they have a bowl here and then sugar. And I don't see cream on this table. But remember, these are artists' choices. Definitely see sugar. Was there ever any trial after the, the tea was thrown in, like to charge anyone? No, they all had full um, deniability. Everyone worked very hard at that. So like he didn't even have a trial, Hutchinson? No. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Now he was too afraid of everybody and they were all disguised. And as I said, Adam, Adams and Hancock were sitting in Hancock's front hall, which was right next to where the state house is now. He had a beautiful mansion right there on Beacon Street. And they were sitting in the front room right on Beacon Street, waving at people. Hello, we're here. We're not there. They're there. They're in makeup. You can't tell who they are and we are here. So. I don't think they were drinking tea, though. I'm pretty sure it was uh, spirits of some sort. Was there tea being uh, sold in the colonies that was not British tea at that time? They or was were it only British. Um, by the time of the famous tea party, probably not. People had agreed to stop drinking it completely. But, you know, there was French and Dutch tea. It was smuggled in, and that was one of the things that Hancock did. He was a very good smuggler um, against British seafaring police. But I don't think there was a lot of tea. They had really given it up. The ministers had made a big point about giving up the uh, wicked weed, and people had put it down and replaced it with other drinks. There's a lot of chicory and herbs and everybody made their own version of something that you could drink. I'm sure most of it wasn't good, but they did grow a lot of medicinal herbs. So maybe they came up with something. Like what we have now, the herbal teas. There you go. Yes, they drank <laughs> chamomile instead of invigorating tea. Herbs <laughs> everywhere, yeah. I'm sorry, Mark, can you repeat that? We can't hear you, Mark. Oh, well. Not me, I didn't say a thing. That's okay. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry. I could come up with a question. <laughs> sorry. All right, anyone else? You can um, write me at dory.history at gmail if you have any other questions. I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Anyone else? I did have a final slide, but that's not important. It, sorry, was, it, was that what you're, are you wearing that same outfit or? No, I'm actually wearing one that's like what the lady is wearing in that um, John, I think Richard Collins, the, the pink, the one pouring the tea. I'll show you, I'll get back to it. I tried to imitate this one. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Ah, that one. Back. Stop. Oh, <laughs> it's taking it too seriously. Okay. That one. Oh. That's the one I'm sort of wearing. The pink one. It's very pretty. Yeah, well, she's hers is better than mine, but you know, I did my best. I don't think mine is silk. I admit it. <laughs> I was thinking those must have been super hot because you said it was like 
what was it, four yards of Oh, the oh no, more like 12 yards 12 for the yards. Roba Francaise. In fact, they are some interesting um, cultural historians have discovered that the upholstery at Winterthur is actually um, made out of women's clothing in Delaware, the DuPont house. So if you're wondering where the clothes went, the families reused them to do the couch. Huh. Would you happen to know how much that would weigh too? I imagine it's like wearing a big backpack almost. It was, I think it was horrible. Um, you did have undergarments that held it up. So the weight was not on your shoulders. It would have been more like around your waist. So like a backpack, not a, um, you know, like a, fanny pack, not so much a shoulder pack. Um, how much would it have weighed? Probably 10 pounds of fabric. It, I don't think it was very popular among working people. I think you had to sit down a lot to wear them. <laughs> At Williamsburg, they do have the mantle makers make them, but not in any reenacting New Englanders that I've seen. So I think it was very much a Virginia upper class thing. New Englanders were very different in the way Puritanism um, fell away, but they were still pretty much austere compared to Virginians, put it that way. Great. Well, Dory, thank you so much. Very, this very been a welcome. fascinating program. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you, Dory. You're very and thank welcome. you, everyone, for joining us.